Hey, uh, daylight savings time. Over Saturday night, make sure you fall back one hour and get that extra hour of sleep because Romans chapter 12 um, in the vernacular of the modern day youth is lit. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to light it up next week as we start Romans chapter 12. Um, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We are going through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 11, and we're going to read uh, a fairly lengthy passage, not too, too bad, but uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25, to the end of the chapter, verse 36. Lest you be wise in your own uh, sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards uh, the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too uh, have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him, that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for the letter to the Romans, uh, how it explains the human condition, and it explains the glory and the mercy of God. Uh, we sometimes feel that we exist for our own selfish interest and selfish gain, and we even use our Christianity to, uh, to uh, try and get something from, from you or to try and use you in a way that is not glorifying to you. So God, today I pray that as we go through this text, uh, we will understand that there is a mystery uh, to who you are, and we will not understand that until we see you face to face. There is a way that you work that we may not in our own hearts approve of, but irregardless, you are perfect, you are holy, you are righteous in all your ways. So I pray for trust. I pray that you would grow us in trust each and every day, and that as we get closer and closer to seeing you face to face, uh, our trust would be uh, one that regardless of mystery, we would love you, we would serve you, we would want to follow you, and we would want to obey you. Uh, I thank you for this text, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, and may you bless our time together. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. I think uh, in our culture today, um, even though people probably don't talk about it a ton, there is uh, a lot of questions about where are we headed, what, what's the end of life, what is life all about, uh, what are we, what's going to happen when I die? Uh, maybe that question goes into the area of what is salvation? What is salvation? And how is a person saved? And how can I be saved? Uh, I say that because the book of Romans is clear on a couple things and it explains that in the human condition, even though you may have not heard the gospel, uh, the created order of all things and your conscience bears to the reality of God. And uh, in inside of us, we all know that we are sinful that we are separated from God and we need a Savior. And the book of Romans, again, is a clear explanation of the human condition in sin and God's plan to save people. And we're at a point in the letter where Paul is explaining to the Jews how these horrible Gentiles are saved. He's also explaining to the Gentiles how the people, the Jewish people who rejected their Messiah are still saved. And I think the point of what he's trying to say through all of that, up through uh, Romans chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11 is this. We are all saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. That is the truth, that is the reality of the human condition, that we must be saved and we are only saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. 
And we're at a place in this letter where Paul is beginning to let the Gentiles know that many Israelites will be saved by their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I think uh, one of the side applications of this, or maybe the side relevancies of, of this, is there is a sense of tribalism that you see in this letter between the Gentiles and the Jewish uh, believers, or maybe not believers, but Jews in general. And this tribalism is allowing their hearts to well up with pride. The Gentiles are saying, you rejected the Messiah, how dare you? Couldn't you see how simple this was? Jesus came, died on a cross, rose from the grave, and can save you from your sin. The Jewish people are looking at the Gentiles and saying, you're not part of the promise, you're not part of the covenant. In their understanding of what the covenant was, they didn't believe that Gentiles could be saved. They were dogs, they were uh, the scum of the earth. And Paul, because he lives in both worlds, he was a, a Roman citizen. He was also a Jewish uh, person by birth. Uh, he knew that tribalism and comparison and contrasting of one people group over another is a sin rooted in pride that can cause the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to be altered, to be changed, to be viewed through a prism that is not true. And so Paul, throughout this letter, is saying to everybody, no matter who you are, all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of God's glory. God saves and he saves everyone he saves through Jesus alone and everyone needs Jesus. So there is no tribalism in the kingdom except for these two tribes. There are sinners and there is Jesus. Um, you know who you are, hopefully. If you have a question about that, please contact me after and we'll walk, walk you through it. There are sinners and there are Jesus. And so all the squabbling and fighting and even the infighting in the church that can go on from time to time and is going on now, whether you see it or not, it happens. Um, there are theological problems. There are sexuality issues at play in the church. All of those things are efforts of people to tribalize the gospel, to separate us from each other as followers of Christ instead of just being obedient to what God has said and to clearly say to each other, all of us have sinned and we need Jesus. And God wants us to know that he alone is perfectly merciful, he is perfectly glorious, and his plan of salvation for all peoples demonstrates this. I saw a quote this week and I can't remember exactly uh, it, it perfectly, but it was talking about there are churches that talk about God's glory, and that's a God-centered gospel. That is a God-centered view of the world and the cosmos. And then there are churches that talk about the cross and how Jesus condescended himself to die on a cross so that we might be saved. And this person making this quote is, a, is actually a, a friend of mine, and he said this, in the context of these are two different camps, and those two different camps are at odds with each other. Folks, those two camps are not at odds with each other. If you believe that your, your existence, your chief end, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, then the cross is the ultimate expression of how we express glory to God, how we revel in God's glory, because He condescended himself to us, died on a cross, and saved us. Those thing, uh, two things are not mutually exclusive, and we are to pursue the glory of God. This passage, again, is about the glory of God. Um, I'm surprised how many times I go to the text and I want to get something for me from it, and what God continually says in the text is, I'm giving you everything you need by telling you that you exist, God exists for his own glory. Uh, that is the essence, the, 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 the everything of the gospel. So let's talk about his glory as we finish chapter 11. And then as I said, next week, we're going to really have some fun in Romans chapter 12. This is the first teaching of this passage. There is mystery in God working out his salvation. There is mystery in God working out 
his salvation. There are two audiences that Paul is talking to throughout this letter, Gentiles and Jews. That encompasses everybody, but there's two different groups of folks, Gentiles and Jews. And Paul wants them to understand that salvation is not about your ancestry. God's plan was to use the Israelite nation to bring Jesus, the Messiah, into the world. And his coming into the world, dying on a cross, raising from the grave, was to bring God glory. God reveled in the act of the crucifixion. He was glorified in it. And we get the benefit of him glorifying himself through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And through the Israelite nation, Jesus comes, the Messiah comes to the world. And Paul says, do not be unaware of the mystery. Okay, this is basically what Paul is saying. Some of you folks really love seminary classes and Bible classes and theology classes. And the reason you love them is it because you want to erect your argument of how you see the Scriptures and you want to argue with the other side. You're not really willing just to take God at His Word. You have to figure it all out. Does anybody know anybody? All the wives are saying, yes, I know someone. It's my husband. He loves to figure everything out. Uh, I'm kind of that way. I want to figure out, especially theologically, I want to figure out everything. And let me tell you, 99% of the theology in the text is very clear. We enjoy making it unclear. So it's very clear. The text is very clear. Not a lot of mystery, but there is some mystery there. And Paul says to them, you can study all you want. You can get as many theological degrees as you want. Your heart is darkened. It will be darkened, but being made less dark as you are sanctified. And then when you're glorified, it will be made uh, clear and you'll understand everything. But there is mystery in God. And I think Paul, he says this many times, not just in this text. I think what he wants to tell us is, accept it. Uh, realize it, accept it, and rest in it that there is mystery. One of the ways that you can do that is knowing that in so many other ways there is no mystery in how God works and the promises that he's made. He has told us things that have happened. He has made prophecies. He has, he has given us his scriptures, his word, so we can trust in that. But there is mystery and wisdom, as much wisdom as we can accumulate for ourselves cannot understand the full and final mysteries of God. This is why it's important to realize this. Usually those who claim to have it all figured out are basically three things. First, they're prideful. Okay, um, They could also be incomplete, and they think they know it all, but they don't, and therefore they're unreasonable, like they don't even know some simple things in Scripture because they're incomplete in their understanding of it. Um, this is the crowd that is, they don't know what they don't know. Uh, the third group can claim to understand mysteries that they really don't, and then they lead people astray. This is cults. Uh, this is false teaching. This is what you would call heresy. This is apostasy. People trying to understand things, they think they claim to understand the mysteries of God, and then they lead people astray, in false teaching, heresy, or even apostasy. And Paul says, don't be unaware, there is mystery in God. Paul says this in terms of salvation, and he has said it before, and here is one of the mysteries that Paul has talked about before, and he says here again in chapter 11. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, I don't know how you take that. Uh, I've learned over time that that's a mystery. The, the mystery of it is, is I don't understand, God, you promised the Israelite nation that they would ble uh, be blessed and that they would bless all peoples. You said that they would have a relationship with you. And yet, there's this partial hardening it reflects back to even Romans chapter 8 and chapter 9, okay, where God hardens someone or someones for a purpose. And this is the purpose. 
It says it in the text. The rejection of Christ as an act of hardening has somehow mysteriously allowed the Gentiles to have access to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. The hardening of the Israelites by God has resulted in our uh, access to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Why? Mystery. I can't necessarily explain it. I think I have a, a good handle on some of that, but I would never uh, uh, speak to this because uh, speak to this mystery because Paul says this is a mystery. God hardened Israel so Gentiles could be saved. Now, there's two kinds of responses to that. The first response is, well, that makes me upset. Why? How dare God do that? How dare God do what in his providence he thinks he should do and is perfectly righteous in doing? I have disagreements with that. Why would he harden someone, meaning separate them from a relationship with God? Their eternal destiny is at stake. Why would he harden them? So you know what I do when I hear that? Praise the Lord that in God's mystery, he hardened some folks so that I could be saved. Like, I, I received the benefit of the mercy and the grace of God through his mysterious, providential, sovereign hardening of the Israelites. He, he goes on to say um, that the rejection of Christ as an act of hardening has allowed the Gentiles to have access to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, and this hardening will continue until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, I have a question, and this is, this is, well, it's a rhetorical question. I wanted to say it's a legitimate question, but I know the answer. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? Does anybody know? Go ahead, shout it out. Got a number in mind? Fullness of the Gentiles. Anybody? Number? You know, what's that? Fullness. Fullness is fullness. The answer is, I have no idea. I have no, I, it'll be a lot because heaven will be full. The fullness of the Gentiles, God knows you don't. God knows what his kingdom will, will, will be like. He knows when he's coming back. He says it'll be like a thief in the night. He says no one can predict the time or the hour. Okay, I come from a tradition, a, a, a Baptistic tradition, that loved to break out the crayons and the napkins and go through the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation and determine the date and the time when Jesus would come back. And it says in Scripture, you can't do that. Now, I can fight against it. I can try to predict it. I can go on the internet and read 18 different articles today on who is predicting that today maybe Jesus will come back. We don't know. You have to uh, put yourself in a position where you're comfortable, you accept because of all the other stuff God has done for you, that you will not know what the fullness of the Gentiles is. No one knows except God and he doesn't uh, uh, accept God, and he alone knows when that will be. Now, there is a finite time that God's grace will be shown through the hardening of Israel to the Gentiles, and God has a number, and it is his, I'm going to use this really bad word, elect. It's his elect. And when that is complete, Israel will be saved. There, there's a multitude of different commentators, and I just wanted to make this as simple as I could, and I think most of the commentators that I looked at are, are in this camp. What does it mean that Israel will be, will be saved? God has a number of Gentiles that will be saved. That's his elect. And when the fullness of that is done, and God alone only knows when and how many and all that, when that's done, there is going to be, before the second coming, a revival, if you want to call it that, amongst Jewish people, Israelites, and many will be saved. It says in the text, all Israel will be saved. Does that mean every single Israelite who has ever lived or who is living at the time? No. It means the fullness of God's elect that he has chosen before time 
along with the Gentile elect that he has chosen before time, he will save them. Not everyone in Israel will be saved, but there will be a time when many in Israel will turn to Christ. And this is part of God's mysterious, merciful, glorious work among the Jews and Gentiles. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 8. I can't read it. Uh, you're invited to go check it out. But it's, uh, it's a cross-reference from what he talks about here, about the deliverer will come uh, from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins because God did covenant with them. He says in Hebrews chapter 8, there's going to be a time where he does what? He puts the laws in the mind of the Hebrews, the Israelites, okay? And they're going to, it says in that text, they're going to teach one another. And it says also in that text that God will show his mercy to them and will take away their sins. God said he's going to do it. And why does Paul go into this Gentile and Jewish thing about being saved? Here it is. Don't be prideful or think you are special because you're a Gentile or a Jew. There is a mystery and God rules over the mystery. I'm okay with that. And the reason I'm okay with that is because the God who spoke it through the revelation in the letter to the Romans through Paul who wrote this letter, that same God spoke and the world and cosmos leapt into existence. I'm pretty good trusting that he's governing the mystery. I'm pretty good trusting that God knows exactly who his elect are and that he will build his family, his elect, his chosen ones, his church, uh, the way that he sees fit, I'm good with the mystery because the God of the universe rules over it. Now here, here's a, a second teaching, and um, you know this is one of those passages in the book of Romans, and there are many, that tells us a very simple truth. God's election is a glorious thing. I wrote up, I think it's on the notes, what election is. Election is God working in the hearts of his chosen elect, I should have added there, before time began, for his glorious purposes of salvation, sanctification, and glorification, and is mysterious to understanding, uh, to understand, but unquestionably a work of God according to the will of God. Conclusion? Trust. God has a plan. When a Gentile considers the gospel and they see the rejection of the, uh, a Messiah, Paul says there is an enmity in that, that God uh, made enmity with the Israelites in order that the Gentiles will be saved, but God has a perfect and holy plan of election both for the Jews and the Gentiles. His election of the Gentiles and Jews is out of his love and mercy for all people and his election is a promise that will not be broken. Um, we'll talk about how the response should be because we're going to see the response of Paul in the last part of this, this particular passage. But this is one of the things that you can rest in. God's plan is irrevocable. Now, there was uh, many times where like, you enter into an agreement, let's say you want to buy a car, and after, you know, you've worked your minimum wage job for a month and your car payment is $733.27, you realize, man, I wish I could revoke this agreement. I don't have that. I want to revoke it. I want to go to the dealership and say, uh, let's revoke this. Now, that's what we think of revocable, is there's an agreement and we want to uh, destroy the agreement or, or remove it. That's not what irrevocable means to God. This is what irrevocable is. God does not regret or feel sorry about his plan of election. He doesn't regret it. Like, I think some of us believe that we could say, hey God, this whole election thing, it's kind of troubling to me. I have, you know, friends and relatives and people in my community that I, I want to be saved and 
I don't know if they're the elect, and could we, could we talk about it? Could we, you know, maybe take this plan of election and make some amendments to it? Just like in the United States of America, we can make some amendments to our Constitution. We can surely amend. Let's get together, God, and I'll bring my case to you, and we'll just sit down and we'll put, you know, our heads together, and we'll figure this election thing out. God doesn't regret or feel one ounce of sorrow about his plan of election. He doesn't question it. He doesn't wonder if he has done the right thing. Um, There's this thing called open theism. And if you're a Christian in America, you are going to run into something called open theism. So, I know some of you want me to boil it down to brass tacks. It's bad, okay? For those of you who want to investigate it further, I can point you to some some works, um, some books, and some different things that will help you, some scripture that will help you work through that. But open theism is this idea that God kind of changes his mind. (laughs) Oh, he doesn't. God doesn't change his mind. Not one molecule of one thing that he has done is regrettable questions or he feels sorrow that he may have done the wrong thing. And one of the the biggest examples of that, that God is perfectly content in his plan, in his sovereignty, in his providence, and ruling over the cosmos, is what Paul says next in this passage. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. (laughs) Consigned means consigned. Consigned means that he acted in a way without uh, any kind of unrighteousness or any kind of imperfection. God in his providence consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. There is mystery there that I can't explain to you. But it's really an interesting way to say this. We are all disobedient, and all of us need a Savior, and this is all part of God's decreed plan. Our disobedience is complete and is ubiquitous. That's a big word. I hope I used it correctly. Uh, It means everyone has disobeyed. Or as my dad used to say, everyone goes bad. There is a disobedience in our heart, and our disobedience, in a way, glorifies and magnifies the mercy of God. There is no special group of people that are morally closer to God than others. Do you see the point? It's all about God's mercy, God's love, God's grace, and his centrality of himself in all things. Now, Paul ends this passage, and I wanted to end a little early today because we have to eat some chili. He ends by celebrating the plan of God. I think one of the reasons why, and I don't know, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm feeling a little ornery, and I'm going to say it anyway. One of the reasons I think churches who preach and teach through passages like this that have a lot of mystery in it, maybe a lot of controversy for some folks, maybe it's very challenging, which is a nice way of saying, man, I don't like this and I want to get out of here as soon as I can, but I got to eat chili and so I'm going to stick around. But one of the reasons why churches like that and and that preach through the text uh, along the lines of this one that can be difficult, one of the reasons why those churches seem to be smaller than others, and again, it's not in every case, is because we don't celebrate the plan of God. We tolerate it. We, We keep it at distance and hope we never have to talk about it, or to allow our hearts to go there because we don't want to think of God 
as a mysterious God who, for instance, consigns us to disobedience so that he will be glorified through his mercy on all people. Paul is different. He celebrates the plan of God. It's an amazing um, text. I actually have written this on our verse chalkboard in our house many times, and I think maybe it's still up there right now. But he says in verse 33 to 36, if I can read, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is right after Paul basically says that God is in charge of salvation He elects whom he has chosen before the beginning of time. It's a mystery. It's providential. It's sovereign. The creator of the universe did it. Accept it. Don't think that you're better than the other just because of your heritage, because of the the tribe that you're in, because of the cause that you support. Everyone is a sinner. God elects some to be saved. And those people are infilled with the Holy Spirit, given a new heart, a new life, a new creation. Paul worships God for God's plan. He doesn't question it. He doesn't dislike it. He doesn't ascribe judgment upon it. And in fact, the depth and mystery of it is overwhelming to him. He is overwhelmed by God's great plan. The depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. He sees God as God and himself as a sinner in need of a Savior. And How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. This is a proclamation of joy. It's a proclamation of worship that it's impossible to understand and it's a bottomless uh, uh, way to comprehend what God does. You can't get it. You can't understand it. It's bottomless. If you try to understand it, you might go crazy. And Paul says, that makes me feel really good about the God I serve. It's this type of inquiry that brings people to two places. I recommend that you read the book of Ecclesiastes, that you read the book of Job. Actually, the book of Job was cross-referenced in uh, this passage. There's two types of people in the world. There's the type of people that see what's going on in the world and they don't understand the mystery of God and They get stiff-necked and rebellious. And they turn from God and say, God, if you're going to run this this world this way, I'm out. I'm not not dealing with this. (laughs) Go read Job. Go read the last, I don't know, seven chapters or so of Job where God answers him. And when you read it, Don't be stiff-necked and rebellious. Rejoice! Rejoice that the God of the universe is so great, so incomprehensible, so beyond us that He is not to be rebelled against. He is to be worshipped. And I put here, face down. Meaning, in awe, in reverence, in complete understanding of how far... uh, infinitely far I am from him in my sin and what he did to bridge the chasm of my sin and a relationship with him he died on a cross worship him he has chosen you to be his child worship him he is going to have heaven so full it'll be like a party that you can't imagine being jostled about singing praises to him and eating at his banquet table forever. Worship him. Paul is in the first camp that I mentioned on the notes, the face-down worship. He quotes from the Old Testament, and the gist is this. God is great, and we are broken. 
Worship him. This great plan leads Paul to basically say this, and we'll get to this next week, where in Romans chapter 12, after 11 chapters, at the beginning of chapter 12, he says, in lieu of all of this, chapters 1 through 11, the logical, reasonable thing to do is to worship him. God is God-centered, and we should be too. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is the end of a, a section of Romans. And now for the rest of this letter, what will our response be? How should we then live in light of these astounding truths? Please don't miss next week. Invite people who aren't here, that are normally here, to be here next week. Invite some friends with you next week. But today I want to ask you this question. Are you overwhelmed by the greatness of God and your brokenness? It's okay to be there. It's okay to be uh, uh, worshipful in the greatness of God and to understand your brokenness because God promises to heal and to redeem and it is by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone that you can be redeemed. So repent and believe. We're coming to the communion table, which, you know, I probably should say this more often, but the communion table is for the elect of God. Those that are the believers. Those that Jesus has saved. Those that Jesus has died for and risen again, showing that He is God and has given them a new heart, given them a new life, and who come to Him daily, face down in worship because of His greatness. And you come broken. You don't come morally like put together. Now God says, confess your sins one to another. If there's something between you and a brother or sister that is affecting you, uh, that is still out there right now, you're to confess that if they're here before you come to the communion table because this is God's body broken, His blood shed, and His mercy and His glory is here at this table. It is available to all who repent and believe. And those who repent and believe are God's elect. You can come to the table maybe for the first time and celebrate and remember what Jesus did on the cross to overcome your sin and your separation from Him and to give you new life in Christ. Let's pray. Father, your mercy is glorious. It's also freeing. Even this week, um, we've struggled with relationships we've struggled with our own sin with the sin of others against us you know we come to a text that tells us that god is sovereign over all things and in our disobedience he wants to show the glory of his mercy we don't have to be better than everybody else we don't have to act superior to everybody else we come broken we come as sinners in need of redemption in need of repentance and belief to your table. And it frees us to love you and to obey you. It's the only reasonable thing to do. I pray, God, that we would enjoy this time together around this table and around the table later as we have lunch together. And that there would be a sense of freedom and peace that I don't have to be better than everybody else. I'm not better than everybody else, and I need Jesus. We thank you for this time, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.